Welcome to part two of um, lecture six, mechanical properties of material. So in lecture one, I've introduced the concept of mechanical properties of materials to you. And um, I've explained the reason for why we need to understand the mechanical properties of a material. We have gone through the stress strain of a, of a material that results from a, a load application and the, the consequence of the load application which is deformation we have understood um, that um, you have a deformation as either elastic or plastic so in the part one of this video we have um, looked at what elastic deformation is and um, the properties of the materials that are associated with elastic deformation so today this particular uh, uh, video is going to focus on uh, uh, the plastic uh, deformation. So we have understood plastic deformation as the irreversible deformation that uh, results from application of an applied load. So we're going to look at what are some of the uh, properties that are associated with uh, plastic deformation. So for plastic deformation, like uh, we have explained uh, in the first part of this lecture, once you apply a load, there is going to be an elongation. That elongation is not reversible, so it will it will result in a, a plastic strain. That is um, the part of the material that that is not able to return back to the original state. So if you have um, going by these uh, uh, schematics on this slide, so if you apply a simple tensional load on a material and you load it beyond the elastic limit. So once you go beyond the elastic limit, you have both, both a an elastic and a plastic uh, uh, elongation incurred. But upon withdrawal of that load, the elastic portion of that deformation will recover completely back to zero, but the plastic part will not recover back to zero. So it will now form a plastic uh, deformation after the load has been, has been withdrawn. Now you see this, this point here is the, is the plastic um, uh, is the plastic uh, part. Let me get my pointer. So, um, uh, okay, I got my pointer. So this point is where the plastic uh, uh, deformation will, this is the point where the, the material will return to after plastic deformation. It will not return back to zero. So this increased length that is incurred as a result of the plastic deformation is what is called the plastic strain. So what you have is that even the arrangement of the atoms upon withdrawal of the load will not be the same as the original uh, arrangement of the atoms before you apply the load. So a permanent deformation that you get, and this is usually happening when you are considering the mat when the material is operating at a temperature that is greater than the melting temperature of the, of the material. So you are looking at, at room temperature. So so what you have is that there's going to be some kind of rearrangement in the atoms and then you can have atoms bonding with new atoms forming different kind of a structure. So, so plastic deformation is, is, is very typical for most materials that have ability to deform. There are certain materials that have very zero or no plastic deformation. We will understand that as, as we go along. So this is what plastic deformation is all about. So. The, the first property that we, we need to understand when you talk about plastic deformation is um, uh, yield strength. So these are called tensile properties because we are, we are looking at properties resulting from the application of a tensile load, which will give rise to tensile properties. So, so remember, I've already explained to you that if you, if you load within the elastic limit, you are going to have a you are going to have a elastic deformation and we have looked at the properties that are associated with elastic deformation those are the um the the the, the elastic uh, modulus that's the stiffness or the modulus of elasticity whichever one that you want to call it then we have talked about poisson ratio so if you go to if you go to the slide on part one you see there are some other uh, elastic property that we didn't discuss there is a uh, there is a modulus of rigidity, there's bulk modulus and all what have you. So there's a relationship, there's a relationship between modulus of rigidity, bulk modulus, elastic modulus, and Poisson ratio. So all of those are elastic properties of material. So for plastic properties of material, these are properties that result from uh, loading beyond the elastic limit, result from the 
from a plastic deformation in simple in simple uh, statements. So the first of them is yield strength. So the yield strength of a material is the is the strength required to produce the very slight amount of plastic deformation. So this is a very this is a very dicey uh, 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 property of a material. So you want to know what strength is going to produce the first plastic deformation in the material. So what it means is that you know the the the, the once you apply load and then plastic deformation begins, you want to know what stress will produce the first plastic deformation. You know, once the plastic deformation begins, it is continuous. So if you don't withdraw the load, it will just be extending plastically continuously. So you want to know at what load the, the material begin to experience plastic deformation. So the stress associated with the load at the point where plastic deformation begins is what will define the yield strength of the material. So now, how do you know? You cannot, you cannot know that physically unless you do the, uh, the stress strain test. So if you do the stress strain test and you obtain the stress strain curve, and you obtain the stress strain curve, like the curve you are having here. So remember, plastic deformation begins immediately after the elastic limit. So the elastic limit cannot, 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 uh, cannot be taken as the, as the yield strength. The stress corresponding to the elastic limits cannot correspond to the yield strength because as at the elastic limit, plastic deformation has not begun. It is beyond the elastic limit that plastic deformation begins. So what do we do? So this has been solved anyway, so I will just go straight and explain to you. So what it means is if you load the material beyond the elastic limit, it begins to deform plastically. So you see along this curve, this is where you have plastic deformation continuously. Now, if, 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 if you now have to choose the yield strength of the material, all you need to do is come to this curve and pick a point beyond the elastic limit and look at what the corresponding stress is at that point. Whatever you get now translates to your yield strength. Now, the first challenge is that if you put up this curve and you probably pick 10 people to pick points that are above the elastic limit in order for you to get the yield strength, it's most likely that they all pick different points and they could all be the, the accurate since they are picking points above the uh, elastic limit. So in order for you to now uh, avoid a situation where you have people having multiple points in order to determine the yield strength of the same material. So there's a convention that allows us to just have a defined uh, point in, for us to obtain the yield strength of the material. So that convention allows us to define an offset. Now, remember I told you that once there is a once there is a plastic deformation, you are going to incur a plastic strain on the material. So that plastic strain is what we now use to obtain our yield strength. So the convention is that we are going to set an offset of 0 0.002 plastic strain. Now this is applicable for most metals. So the result, the resulting stress. Once there is a there is a, there is an offset of 0 0.02 plastic strain will correspond to the yield strength of the material. So how do you obtain that plastic strain? All you need to do is measure a strain of 0 0.002 from this zero point. So that point 0 0.002, you trace a line that is parallel to the elongation. That is that is parallel to the elastic elongation here. That is proportion that is parallel to this proportional axis until it touches the curve, the stress strain curve. Anywhere this um, 0 0.002 uh, offset touches the curve. The stress corresponding to that particular point is what now defines the yield strength of the material. So this solved the problem of trying to get multiple points above the elastic limits. So this is now um, this is now an approximation of the the where you begin to ex when the material begin to experience a. Uh, plastic deformation. So you see, an offset of 0 0.002 is quite very small, but you are sure that at this point you have incurred uh, plastic deformation. So what it means is at this point, even if you withdraw the load at this point, the material will not return back to zero. It will return with an offset of 0 0.002. So the stress corresponding to this point is what we define as our yield stress. So in very simple terms, if you want to determine the yield stress, all you need to do is 
get a strain of measure a strain offset of 0 0.002 draw a line that is parallel to the linear region on the curve where the line crosses or intercepts the curve the stress strain curve find the corresponding stress to that point and that gives you the yield strength so 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 the proportional limit will allow you to to know where um, uh, um, elastic deformation will end and above it if you do if you carry out this simple step you'll be able to get the, the yield strength so what what you what you now get is um the yield strength now what is the essence of the of the yield strength the essence of the yield strength is that if you want to put a material through an through an application through an application and you don't want the material to experience any form of plastic deformation so what it means is you have to specify in your in your prescription of uh, the material to be used for that application with the yield strength so what it means is that if you if you say for instance a material has a yield strength of say 100 megapascals an example so if the yield strength is 100 megapascal what it means is that if you are if you are loading that material during operation the moment you load up to 100 you apply a stress that is up to 100 megapascal the material will deform plastically so if you don't want the material to experience any form of plastic deformation you make sure that you don't load with this space anywhere close to a hundred megapascal so this is the importance of uh, this uh, yield stress so if you if there are so many applications where you don't want deformation or you want that even if the material is deforming during application it is able to recover completely so if you don't want any permanent deformation incurred on the material during operation then you have to avoid loading anywhere close to the yield strength of the material so these are typical these are examples of uh, yield strength these are exam these are yield strength of a material so we have for different class of material we have for metallic alloys we have for semiconductors here yeah, ceramic materials we have for polymer and we have for composite material so this this region are for metal so you can see the material with the highest yield strength here is steel which is which is which is close to close to 2000 uh, megapascal close to 2000 megapascal yield strength so you can see you can see how 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 difficult it will be to permanently deform steel compared to tin for instance so you see it's easier to deform a tin compared to steel so you can see how low the yield strength of tin is so i'm i'm sure you are all conversant with uh with uh, there are different class there are different grids of steel anyway so the the the, the highest of them is this so there are certain steel that has that are that are within 200 megapascal you can see for copper you can see for aluminium and all what have you so if you compare the if you compare the yield strength of uh, metallic alloys for instance against uh, those of the polymer you will see that um, polymers have very low yield strength very very low yield strength so you see it's easier to deform them plastically than to do for metal so you see low density polyethylene very very low very very low low density polyethylene that's why it's easy even you if you take if, you, if it's easier to to plastically deform a polymeric material compared to this now interestingly if you look at a uh, ceramic material you see that there is, there is no there, there is no value attached to any of the uh, ceramic material this is this is simple ceramic materials have very little or no plastic deformation they don't deform plastically so that is why they they have the brittle they have the brittle nature so a typical example is your 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 ceramic materials at home your your, your ceramic plates and all what have you they don't deform plastically so what they do is they just shatter so once you load them beyond certain uh condition they don't they don't there's no room for deformation so so you don't you, that's why you have to be careful when you are using them for an engineering application they don't they don't they don't show you sign they don't deform plastically before they, they fracture they just fracture straight away once set once set it once set they, they exceed certain maximum load so this is the importance of um, yield strength so for ceramic material they are very little or no plastic deformation so that is why no no value is attached to ceramic materials here the the, the second tester property is tensile strength so this is the maximum stress that a material can take this is the maximum so what it means is beyond beyond this particular stress the material is tending to failure beyond this the material is tending to failure so if you draw a stress strain curve like you have here the maximum load on that curve 
the stress corresponding to that peak point defines the tensile strength of a material. So this is very, very important. Before you put up an application for any material, you must understand what the tensile strength of that material is, if the material will be used under um, a, a tensile loading condition. So if it is under a if it is if it is under a compressive loading condition, you must know what the compressive strength should be. If it is under shear, you must know what the shear strength is. So how do you get all of this? This is the maximum stress that the material can take. So and it, so once you once you carry out a, a stress strain uh, test on the material, the, the, the curve that will be generated, the peak, the maximum value on that curve will generate, will, will, will determine or will correspond to the tensile strength of the material. And this is very, very important. So this is tensile strength. So we have talked about we have talked about uh, the the this this is the first point. This is the elastic limit, right? This point P that's your proportional limit. That's your elastic limit. After which you have your yield strength. That is sigma y. And then you have this your m. This point m translates to your tensile strength. So the moment you exceed the tensile strength, where you are going to now is fracture point. So for materials that can deform plastically, they don't fracture immediately. So what it means is they can continue to deform plastically until the now fracture. So, but, so what it means is before fracture, you have some form of plastic deformation. But for ceramic materials, you don't experience this plastic deformation. The moment they go or they experience certain maximum load, they will just fracture immediately. So that's why we used to associate attribute a catastrophic failure to uh, uh, ceramic materials. So, so one, one, simple, one good, uh, one very important observation here is that um, if you want to specify the tensile property of a material, for instance, so which one is better? Should you specify in terms of yield strength or should you specify in terms of a tensile strength? So this, 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 uh, these are very, this is a very typical questions that you will you will be thrown at if you really understand the properties of a material. So uh, and I'll give you a simple answer to this. So if you if you design a material for this for instance, you are going to specify a, 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 a tensile property for that material for your user. Now if you if you specify the yield strength as the tensile property as the strength of the material, your user will make do with that value. And if you specify the tensile strength as the strength of the material, your user will make use of that value. So which one is better? So speaking from the engineering safety point of view, it is better to specify the strength of the material by the yield strength rather than the tensile strength. So you know, the implication is that if you specify by the yield strength, you are giving room for any error to occur, and then the there will not be danger of failure so but if you specify by the tensile strength it means once there is any failure or there's any uh, uh, uh laxity from the end user there could be problem so it is better to specify the strength of a material by the yield strength for a uh, reason based on uh, safety than to specify by the tensile strength in any way you don't want to load the material close to that strength, even with the yield strength. So you, even with the yield strength, you don't want to go close. So there's a factor of safety that you have to consider that will ensure that you did not load the material close to what their strengths are. So by so doing, you will have, uh, you'll be, you have, you have, uh, you, you, you'll be sure that the material will not fail during uh, operation. Now, once you once you exceed the maximum uh, point where you have your tensile strength, you will realize that the curve now begins to the curve now begins to go down. The curve begins to go down. Now, this reduction in the curve means that the moment you exceed the maximum on that curve where you have your uh, uh, tensile strength, you now begin to experience the material begins to experience a phenomenon that is called necking. So what it means is that from, from that point, any additional load will now be concentrated at a point on the material. Now that concentration will now cause a neck at that point. So subsequent additional loading 
So, so subsequent elongation that you have and subsequent stress that you are in, that you are imposing on the material will be concentrated along that neck region. So that neck region is the one that will now be experiencing the total stress that you are imposing on the material once you exceed that maximum point. And that neck region is what is where the fracture will eventually occur. So what it means is that if you are loading a material, the moment you load and you have loaded up to the tensile strength, any additional stress that you put on that material, even though the stress will be declining as you, as you can see on this curve, what, it, what you will get eventually is that there will be a neck. There will be something like a neck, like the neck here is referring to a human neck. Just the way you can see, you can see on this diagram, you see the neck. So the, the, the stress, the additional stress now will be concentrated, not, not longer on the entire material, but this neck region will be created. This constriction that you see is the neck. And then subsequent deformation will be confined to this neck until the material will now eventually fail. Now, what is the implication of what is happening here? We'll be explaining this in the next slide. So what you have here is that once you begin to have neck, so by the stress strain curve, you will see that the curve is coming down. But the curve, the curve is coming down because the entire material is no longer experiencing the additional stress that you are imposing. But the net region is now taking the stress that you did, additional load that you are adding. Now, but one thing you will now notice is that the cross sectional area at this net region becomes very small compared to the cross sectional area of the material you started with. So, if you remember, we defined the engineering stress of the material as the applied load divided by the original cross-sectional area. But the moment this neck begins to form, that cross-sectional area reduces, and all the load that you are imposing at that point is concentrated at that neck region. So the implication is that the, the, the cross-sectional area is no longer the same as what you started with originally. So the stress that you have at that point is, com is now completely different from the engineering stress that you have attributed to the material initially so this now means that we are now going to have a new cut a new type of stress on the material once the necking begins that new stress is what is called the true stress and the corresponding strain there is called the true strain so in this case now the true stress will now be the load applied divided by instantaneous area that is the area of that neck region once the material begins to experience that necking. So you now have true stress and true strain. So the true strain is given by lean Li by L0, where Li is the instantaneous length and L0 is the original length. So there's a relationship between true stress and engineering stress. There is a relationship between true strain and engineering strain. These relationships are given in this equation below. <coughs> so the, 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 third property to, the third property is ductility. So ductility is the measure of the degree of plastic deformation that a material sustains at fracture. So if you want to measure how much deformation the material has endured before it fracture, that will be measured by understanding what the ductility of a material is. So if you, if you this, this, these, are two, these are two curves on the same graph, on this diagram. So you have the stress strain curve for a beetle material. You have a stress strain curve for a ductile material. So what's the difference? For a ductile material, it means the material, once, it's, once it exceeds the proportional limit, the elastic limit, it can experience deformation for some time before it will eventually fail. But for brittle material, remember I told you there are very little or no plastic deformation. So once they experience load up to certain point, they don't experience plastic deformation, or even if they do, a very little plastic deformation before they fill. So you have a stress strain curve for a beetle material as indicated here, and a stress strain curve for a ductile material as indicated here. So the, the what you have here now, what you have here is that um, you will see that the brittle material has a higher strength compared to the ductile material. So that's why brittle material are high strength material. Example, the ceramics, but they are they are plastic they, they are very little or no plastic deformation but those doctor material they don't have they are not they, they don't have as high strength as the brittle material but they can deform plastically before they eventually fracture
So how do you measure ductility? Very simple. These two equations will help you in measuring ductility. So you can measure ductility either in terms of percentage elongation or percentage area reduction. So if you want to measure in terms of percentage elongation, it is the final length minus original length divided by the original length expressed in terms of percentage. And if you want to measure in terms of percentage area reduction, it is the original area minus the final area divided by the original area also expressed in percentage. So, so this, so if you if you if you apply a tensile load, you are going to have an increase in area. There's going to be an initial length. There's going to be a final length. So if you if you implement this equation, it will allow you to get the percentage elongation. And if you want to do in terms of the cross-sectional area, so you know if you if you if you apply a tensile load in this direction, what will happen to the cross-sectional area? The initial area will be different from the final area. So if it is in tension the initial area will be greater than the original area. If it is under compression, the initial area will be, will be, will be smaller than the uh, final area. So whichever one, whichever one you take will help you measure the ductility of the material. So, and these two are comparable. So they are very comparable. So the, um, the how do you now determine whether a material is, uh, how do you determine whether a material is, uh, is brittle or the material is doctor. This will be determined by the, the, the percentage elongation that you have in, in, in question. So if, if, your, if your percentage elongation is beyond certain level, then the material will be said to be, uh, will be, said to be uh, uh, doctor. And if it is will be said to be doctor, and if it is below certain level, the material will be said to be a uh, 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 brittle. Okay. So the, the fourth is modulus of resilience. This is modulus of resilience. So this is the ability of the material to absorb energy when it deforms elastically, and then to have this absorb energy recovered upon on loading once you remove the load. So this ability to absorb energy when you apply load and release come and then have this energy recovered completely. So what, when you unload the material is what is called the modulus of resilience. So usually, the modulus of resilience can be measured with this equation. That is, um, the modulus of resilience is um, uh, um, yield strength raised power two divided by two e. E here is modulus of uh, elasticity. So what what you need here is these two parameters, and then it allows you to measure the modulus of uh, uh, resilience. Now, however, if you if you don't have these two parameters, if you have your stress strain curve, you can still measure your modulus of resilience from the stress strain curve. So the modulus of resilience from the stress strain curve is going to be the area under the curve within the elastic region. So specific here, the specific point of interest here is the elastic region. So the area under the curve within the elastic region will give you the modulus of resilience. So if you if you try to calculate this area using what you have here, you will see that you will still get this equation. So this is how you calculate modulus of resilience. So the, the fifth is toughness. So the toughness of the material is the ability of the material to absorb energy up to fracture point. So, so if, you, if, you, if you want to measure that ability to absorb energy up to fracture point, that is the toughness of the material. Now that toughness in this case is similar to uh, resilience. The only difference is that for resilience, you are considering energy absorbed up to the elastic limit, not beyond. But for toughness, you are considering energy absorbed from beginning up to the fracture point. So while you are using the area under the elastic uh, region to measure your modulus of resilience, you need the entire area under the stress strain curve to measure the toughness of the material. So there is, there is another <clears throat> There is another quantity that is called fracture toughness that I didn't mention here. So the fracture toughness is the ability of the material to resist propagation of cracks. So once there's a crack in a material, materials have ability to prevent that crack from elongating, from extending. The ability to, to prevent that elongation or extension of cracks is what you call a fracture toughness. So this, those ones are usually measured for ceramic materials where you want to put in certain things to allow them to have some level of uh, toughness because of their brittle nature. Okay, so those are those are um, um, those are plus what we have discussed so far. They are properties that are attributed with plastic deformation. So what about those materials that don't deform plastically or they have very little plastic deformation? What property do we associate with them? 
the property you associate to such material is the hardness is the hardness so so for you can also attribute hardness to some other materials that that um that deform plastically also so what is hardness so the hardness here is just the way you want you know you usually say this material is hard that material is hard no so sometimes you need to understand what you mean by hardness of a material so the resistance of a material to permanent deformation is what is called um uh, uh hardness so resistance to plastic deformation or resistance to cracking or resistance to compression is what is called the uh, hardness of a material so resistance to permanently indenting a surface so by indenting a surface it means you are trying to impose a plastic deformation a permanent deformation to that surface so the resistance of that uh, uh, material to indentation is what is called uh, hardness of a material or resistance to scratch the resistance to scratch that's why you see that it's easier to scratch metals it's easier to scratch scratch polymer but it's not so easy to scratch a ceramic material so that's because the ceramic materials are hard material they are harder than the metals and the polymeric material so the more brittle a material is the harder it is and the higher the strength of that material will be now of course you will know that the the, the negative implication is that they will not be ductile they lose ductility so as you increase strength you increase hardness but you lose ductility you lose toughness of the material so you see that the area that defines a brittle material is very small compared to the area that defines a ductile material so the implication is that brittle materials have high strength but they are not tough why the ductile materials are tough but they have a low strength compared to the brittle material so what out what we do what the the, the the property that is measured for for high strength material which uh, the brittle material is hardness so how do you measure hardness uh, the way you measure hardness is to try to make an indentation so and then the resistance of the material to that indentation is what is used to measure the hardness so what you need is a hardness tester what the hardness tester does is that there's an indenter a force is applied on the indenter to cause an indentation as you can see on this in this particular case the indenter here is a circular ball sometimes the indenter may not be a circular ball so what happens is once you apply load to the indent to the indenter it will try to cause an indentation on the on the material so you see the material based on its hardness will try to resist this indentation and the resistance to this indentation is what you use to measure the hardness so the properties of this indentation that the ball makes on the material is what you will use to measure the hardness of the material so there is a there is a hardness scale that you have once you are able to calculate there is there are different kinds of hardness measurements we have the rockwell hardness measurement we have the vickers hardness measurement we have the micro hardness measurement so if you go to the calista textbook you see the equations that defines um these hardness uh, measurements and then you will see this if you go to the textbook i'm sure you cannot see this scale very well so you 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 will see this scale clearly that allows you to measure the hardness based on the the value you get from the hardness uh, measurement uh, equation that you use so there is, there, what is the correlation between the strength of a material and hardness i think i mentioned this earlier uh not long ago so you will see that um there is a proportionality between uh, hardness and uh, strength so you have this uh, graph that is there to show the relationship between hardness and tensile strength for steel for brass for cast iron also so you will see that um, this is uh, this is brinell hardness that was measured and this is tensile strength so you see they all presented a proportional curve a straight line curve to show you that they, there is proportionality between the strength and the hardness so what it means is the higher the strength the higher the harder the material becomes so the the, the harder the material the more the, the more high strength it becomes so there is so there is a proportionality between the strength of the material and the hardness of the material so so for ceramic materials for ceramic materials if you want to measure if you want to measure their properties remember they don't have any form of plastic deformation so what you need to do is that uh, once you do the stress strain curve just like we have done for other material you will get just a straight line because there will, there, there will be no any plastic deformation region so you just have you just have a proportional region you have a peak point where the material will just fracture straight away so most most ceramics are brittle 
you and you need a very large amount of stress in order to make them fracture unlike other materials like metals like polymers that can endure some plastic deformation so you have this the, the you have the you have the same testing apparatus that i explained earlier in part one of this particular lecture and then you apply the same thing so the only thing you the only um the other things that you can do is that there are other properties that you can also measure for ceramic materials that allows you to, to define some other properties of the ceramic materials so one of the other properties that you can measure is is is, is uh the flexural strength is the flexural strength of a material you can do this for ceramic you can do for metals you can do for some polymers also so if the, the difference between this is the loading configuration so for a for a, for the flexural strength of a material for instance you need a three point bending configuration as you can see here so you need a three point bending configuration and then you have to now shape your your specimen to either have a rectangular shape or a circular cylindrical shape so whichever one that you take you will require this equation to measure the flexural strength so for a rectangular for a rectangular shape you need to measure what the second moment of inertia is so if you have a three point bend configuration as you can see so the the universal testing machine has this uh, this loading configuration so once you place your specimen on this uh, three point loading configuration and you apply the load the material will bend and fail so the 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 parameters that you get after the upon failure is what you will use to estimate what the pleasure strength or the bend strength is and depending on how you want to you want to call it so the strength is equal to um mc over i so so m m is moment i is second moment of inertia and c is uh is the centroid that is the the the, the height the the mid the mid uh, uh, the mid height of the specimen so so which is in if it is a rectangular specimen it is going to be d over two which is the the depth the depth of the specimen and if it's a circular specimen your c is going to be the radius of the circular specimen so for rectangular specimen your moment is fl over four for circular is ml over four and then your second moment your moment of inertia for a cross section that is rectangular is uh, uh three fl divided by 2bd square uh, so you have also for a circular there so you can also use you can use this uh, equation to measure the bend strength of the material so you you have you have this is just this is just to show the relationship between the elastic modulus and uh, the the load that you are applying this is to show that the elastic modulus is proportional to the load that is causing the bending so you can use this to measure the the pleasural strength so this is an example like i want you to i want you to play around with so if you look at this example so there's a loading span there's a load span of uh 45 mm you have uh the, the specimen is having a, a a depth of 15 mm and a width of 10 mm so you, sh you should be able to calculate the pleasure strength if you apply a if you apply load at fracture if the load at fracture is 290 newton so 290 newton so you can you can apply that same formula for this particular uh specimen configuration to calculate the the uh, pleasure strength and then if you get that you can also calculate the deflection you can give this a trial as an exercise so for 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 polymeric materials for polymeric materials the stress behavior the stress strain behavior will look like this so you see different from the brittle material for polymeric material you will have a substantial plastic deformation before the material will eventually fail so if the material is plastic you will have something like this if it is highly elastic highly elastic means that it can have an appreciable uh, deformation before it fails so but one thing you will see that is very interesting here is that the the more elastic the material is the less the strength will be and the more deformation the more uh, elongation it will go through before it will eventually uh, before it will eventually fracture so this is also very very important so sometimes uh, these curves are very important from first examination so if you if you just need to give if you need to understand certain properties of a material from the 
from the um, from the stress strain curve at first sight, you can you can pre, you can say certain things about the material in terms of the strength, in terms of the ductility, in terms of the toughness, in terms of the resilience of the material. So 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 if you have uh, this also for a semi-crystalline, this also for a polymeric material, and what this is trying to show, this is trying to show that um, for a semi-crystalline polymer, if you if you load and once you get to the yield point and then you start you see that the moment you exceed the yield point you start having necking so unlike unlike metallic materials once the neck is formed you are very close to fracture with polymeric material especially semi-crystalline polymeric so you see that even at the onset of necking the formation is just beginning so even at the onset of necking the material can still go through a lot of plastic deformation before it fails but interestingly you will notice is that all the deformation that the material is experiencing now is now around the next region so it is the next region that continues to elongate before the material will eventually fail so this is you this is very important for you to understand and this is not obtainable in metallic materials in metallic materials once the neck once you exceed the maximum stress and the necking begins it, it doesn't take so long the deformation you experience from the neck is not so much before the material will eventually fail. So, lastly, you can have a <coughs> visco elastic uh, deformation of a material. So, so here you can have a situation where there is a there is um, what we have what we have considered is a a, a situation a, a kind of deformation that is strictly on instantaneous application of load. So you can have viscous, you can have deformation of a viscous material, and then once you have um, elastic deformation in viscous material, it translates to viscoelastic deformation. So if you have a, a situation where there is a, you want to consider the mechanical characteristics of a material that is exhibiting both viscous flow and elastic deformation, as example of a, a rubbery solid you have what is called viscoelasticity and it can come in form of elastic can be viscoelastic it can be viscous so if it is elastic we have talked about elastic we have talked about uh, elastic uh, deformation if it is viscous if it is elastic you have an instantaneous response with a comp with a recovery you have a recovery up to failure but if it is viscous there is delay response and then you can have a combination of the two, which is which is what you have here. So if you have um, if you have uh, for instance a, a amorphous polymer that that at low temperature will be behaving like a glass. So or you have a rubbery solid at certain temperature. So what you have is that um, the 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 there is there is a small deformation. There is a small deformation there that can be attributed to elastic deformation and then there's there, there's possibility of another kind of deformation that can be attributed to viscous uh, deformation so the combination of these two is what will give you the total deformation which you can terms as viscoelastic uh, deformation so I, I i i like to stop here and i want you to take your time you can you can read this up these are these are these are simple uh, these are simple uh, terminologies so like i said in the beginning of the of the video we are not going so deep into the into the lecture so it's just to understand the basic concept so our our focus more in this particular uh, 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 um, lecture is to understand the concept of loading the configurations of loading the effect of loading which is which is a deformation the relationship between the load and the deformation which is the stress and strain and then based on the type of deformation that you have, whether it's a, an elastic deformation or a plastic deformation, what are the properties of the material that you need to understand as a result of the deformation the material must have uh, experienced? And what are the importance of these uh, properties that we have tagged mechanical properties of the material, especially when the material is being put to use and how they have, how, what effect do they have on the safety of the material during application you must understand that every engineering design 
comes along with safety measures. So in the material uh, aspect of considering safety, you want to ensure that you are not loading the material beyond the limit that it can endure. So once you are able to ensure that, then the material will sustain and endure whatever load you, ex you have exposed it to, and then you don't envisage any failure. Of course, like I said, there are so many other factors that can contribute to failure, but what we have focused so much here is the failure that can result from mechanical loading. So what it means is if you're able to take care of the failure that can result from mechanical loading, then you can focus on all other type of failure depending on the kind of material that you are using. So I will stop here for this lecture. I encourage you to read more from the textbook. If you have uh, questions to ask concerning this lecture, I've said it in the first, you can contact me in via all the available channels. You have my phone numbers, so you can, you can give me a call. You can send me WhatsApp message. I think preferably WhatsApp message. So once you watch this video, you can you can take note of any questions you can talk you can send those questions to me via whatsapp you have my you have my phone number if you don't have the phone number please contact your class rep to give you the phone the number i don't want to i don't want to call out the number uh in this video so it's deliberate it's intentional so you can you can talk to your class rep to to give you uh my phone number and then you can send me whatsapp messages with a complete uh, request of whatever uh, questions that you have and, uh, and I assure you that I will respond accordingly. So please continue to keep safe. Hopefully we will, we will be fine and then we will we'll get over the, these challenges in, in, in a very, in not in, in no long time from now. I wish you all the very best. So please, you are, there, will, there will still be one more lecture to go, which is going to be the final, uh, the last topic for the semester like i promised so i will get that across to you once the once it is ready thank you very much and have a lovely day bye bye